Why is it when I get up to speak, half of the crowd leaves? <laughs> thank you for the for, thank you for that, Mike. Here's something I know: you all to be really, really glad that they didn't ask me to sing today. I can just tell you that. <clears throat> so years ago, they did a. I probably ought to stand right here, shouldn't I? I have a tendency to wander. Years ago, they did a poll of people asking them this question: What's your number one fear in life? And uh, you might be surprised at the results. Some that you might offer from from your chair would be the fear of spiders. Some of the people are just scared to death of spiders. Some are scared of snakes. Usually if you're scared of one, you're not so fond of the other either. Uh, heights, there's a fear of some people. Small places, of claustrophobia is a fear of some people. I was a bit surprised that the number one answer, however. Here's the number one answer when people were asked, what's your number one fear in life? And here it is. <clears throat> to live a life that really in the end didn't matter. Just at the end of your life, when I put my head on the pillow for the last time, I think, yeah, it didn't make any difference in my life. That's people's number one fear. I think it's tragic to see a wasted life. All of you have seen somebody, as best as we can tell as people, we're not God and we're not judge and jury, whatever you think, wow, that seems like a wasted life. To see gifts, talents, and opportunities go to waste. It's also tragic to think we're doing really, really well, or somebody else thinks they're really, really doing well, they're knocking it out of the park, and at the end of life, maybe Jesus would say, wow, you didn't live a life well at all. That would be tragic, too, to think you're really getting an A in this class in life, and then, no, the teacher, the the God of the universe, no, you didn't do well at all. So ask a couple questions to get us started here. What do, you, what do you think you have to do to live a well-lived life? And so at the end of life, God himself would say, absolutely, well done. Or if somebody came to you and they called you by name and said, and fill in your name here, in my case, Bill, Bill, what, what do you have to do so when you get to the end of life, it's not just a waste, that you really didn't make a difference? How would you answer that question? Well, there's tons in the Bible. We don't have time to cover a lot of it, but we're going to look at one passage this morning. So if you would, take your copy of the Scriptures, go to the second letter to Timothy, so 2 Timothy chapter 4, as we talk about what I'm going to call a well-lived life. So as you're turning there, context is huge in Bible study. What's going on in the story before you get to the part we're going to pick up? So Paul is in prison when he writes this letter. He was in prison earlier, this first imprisonment of Paul's when he when you end the book of Acts um, he wrote in that arrest he's under kind of what we would call a house arrest remember several years ago when uh, Martha Stewart was under house arrest y'all remember this she wore a little anklet on her whatever her ankle and she couldn't leave her compound but I mean this was not suffering this was a really nice place she lived right well Paul wasn't living in a really nice place in his first arrest but the book of Acts ends that he could re- he was in a house and he could receive friends but he couldn't come and go. And his friends had to bring him food and things like that. The Romans didn't provide food. But he had to stay put. That's his first house arrest. Or first arrest. And during that time, he didn't waste his time. He wrote four letters we call the prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And God's used those for the last 2,000 years to minister to people like us. Great. Well, he was released. And he was later in prison by this wonderful guy named Nero. And now he's in prison the second time. This time he's in this Mamertine prison, which is in Rome, and it is dank, dark, and nasty. All right? Things are not really nice now. And he writes this letter. This is Paul's last letter before he dies. If you know your New Testament a little bit, you say, wait, wait a minute, Corver. <laughs> Titus comes after this book, and I happen to know Paul wrote Titus too. Well, you'd be correct, but chronologically they're in, not in the right order. Okay, so this is First Timothy, then Second, and then Titus. But this is his last book. And so it's the last letter of his last book, and he's perhaps hours or days away from execution. That's when Paul writes this letter. Okay? So you can just imagine if you knew, hey, in the next couple of days, that's it, I'm out of here, and I'm going to be taken to the undertaker, and that's it, what would you write? Well, here's what he writes. We'll look in just as, as we go. 2 Timothy, again, chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. You follow along, I'll read in my New American Standard, which says... <clears throat> And remember, he's writing to Timothy. This is his second letter to this guy. By the way, that's the only person in the entire Bible that had two letters written to them that are included in the Scripture. It would be Timothy. All right? 
And he says this, verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. Well, verse 6, I'll give you the point, and we'll dive into it. I think part of what Paul is telling us is this. The price of a well-lived life. This is what it's going to cost to live a well-lived life. Verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. So that first phrase there, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Paul used that same uh, imagery in Philippians. We're not going to go there, but in Philippians he talks about being poured out as a drink offering. To be, a, to, be, to be a drink offering, here's what that meant. So a lot of us, when we think about, i got to keep over here, don't I, because of the microphone, sorry, <laughs> the tendency to go. We think of offerings, here's what we usually think. We think of an animal sacrifice, and you'd give your animal to the priest. The priest would cut the throat of the animal, drain the blood, put it on an altar, offer it to the Lord. That's one kind of offering. But there were also grain offerings, and there were other kinds of offerings. Well, one was a drink offering, and as the title implies, it was a measure of wine, and it was in a skin. They didn't have bottles, a wine skin. And the measurement in Hebrew is a hin, H-I-N, but it would be a, between a pint and a quart for us. So just think 24 ounces of wine and a wine skin. And if you were really just thrilled and, about what God had done and was doing in your life and you just want to say, thank you, God, you'd say to the priest, I want you to offer this for me as a drink offering to the Lord, just as a thank you. And the priest would take that and he would pour it out. It's just a skin of wine until he pours it out. And once he pours it out, that's the offering. Paul uses that imagery to say, that's, that's what I am. Forget the wine, it's me. I am being poured out as a drink offering for you and for the Lord. Now, we don't use drink offering uh, words like that anymore, but here's what we do. We do say things like this. If you have somebody at work, a co-worker who's really, really knocks it out, she just gives everything to her job, you might say something like, she just pours herself into her work. It's the same image. In other words, you give everything of you to this job. And Paul says, that, that's what it's like when it comes to my life of service. I, I gave everything to serve, to serve Jesus. Now let me give to see if I can illustrate it this way. Y'all ever, y'all ever brush your teeth, yeah? Yes. If you didn't say yes, just stop breathing for a while, okay? So you're at home, you get this, like a tube of toothpaste, right? And you, you, you know, can y'all work with me here? Okay, so you have a tube of toothpaste, and it's brand new, it's wonderful. You just squeeze it anywhere, and something comes out. But the more and more you use it, the harder it is to get stuff out of it, right? And you get to that point when it's just about all gone. Y'all been there? Okay. And I don't know how it works with your, at your house, but here's what I do. I'm giving you a little secret, okay? So you take the toothpaste, and you put it on the bathroom counter, right? And you get your, the, the handle of your toothbrush, and you start, right? And you get it to the end, right? And then there's that little bit, and then you can get two or three more brushes out of it. Then there's that little you know, goofy part that goes from, like, square to the round part. And if you really try hard, you squeeze, but if you let go of your finger, it go, goes back in the tube before you can get your... But you can't get the toothpaste on. I see y'all have, y'all have done the same thing I've done. And so part of what Paul's saying is, if you want to live a well-lived life, let me just tell you right now, it's going to cost you... Like a drink offering, there's no, there's no wine left in that skin. It's like that toothpaste tube, if it could talk, is saying, you know, I, I got nothing left to give. That, that's it. I cannot give any more. So what, what's the price? Here's the price. Here's some parts of the price. It'll cost you dearly on time. You cannot serve Jesus well without investing time. You just can't do it. It takes time to prepare sermons. It takes time to work up music. It takes time to be in the nursery. It takes time to prepare Bible study lessons. It takes time. It'll probably cost you financially. Uh, You know there's this thing in the Bible called uh, uh, offerings and this thing called tithe, T-I-T-H-E. Do you all work hard for your money? Two of y'all work hard for me. The rest of y'all don't work. Or... Okay, so if you work hard for your money, here's the, here's the way America tends to work. I work hard for money. I want to save my money because the only way you get ahead in this world is you save it, right? And God says, no, no, I want you to be generous with your money. Just give some away. Give generously. Well, if you're going to follow it, it's going to cost you. And it's going to cost you you. 
Uh, just a quick thought, we'll move on. When was the last time you were absolutely exhausted from serving Jesus? Not exhausted, because we, we, we work really hard at our play, but sometimes we don't work very hard at serving Jesus. When was the last time you were exhausted from serving Jesus? By the way, it's a, one of the most blessed exhaustions you'll ever experience in your life. When were you exhausted from serving Jesus? Paul says, if you want to live a life well lived, it's going to cost you. Here's a rhetorical question, we'll move on. What's your role? What's your ministry here at Dalton? What's your, if, I said, what's your, if I came up to you after service and said, so what, what is it you do to make Dalton a better place to serve and to be? What would the answer be? And he said, well, <laughs> I don't have anything. I just throw a little something in the plate every now and then. Find something to do and do it. It's going to cost you. Well, as somebody said, I might have gone from preaching to meddling, so let's go back to the text. <laughs> A life well lived is going to cost you. There's the price in verse 6. Here's my simple way of stating it, looking at it. So if I really want to do that, what's the process? What's the path I would take to live this well lived life? Well, verse 6. Give me verse 7. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Thinking, okay. What does that mean? Well, let's go back a little bit. Take your Bible. Keep your finger here. Go back probably a page or maybe two in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. Now, before we read those verses, here's something you need to know. We read our Bibles very differently than people in the first century would have. Who was this letter written to? Timothy, Timothy right? So we, we're used to study like a, a couple of verses that Bill's going to preach on today, and then maybe next week, I'm not saying he should, but Dan's going to pick up and he'll finish a few more verses in a second. That's the way we do things. Just think of getting a letter in the mail. Now, they didn't have mail service, but just think of getting a letter in the mail. How many of you, when you get a letter in the mail, we don't even send letters anymore, we do texts and emails and all, but if you got a real letter in the mail, how many of you would read the first page of a three-page letter and set it down and pick up the second page next week? We don't read letters that way. We read the whole letter. And so when Timothy's reading this letter, when we get to what we call chapter 4, like three minutes ago, he'd have read chapter 2. Does this make sense? Okay, so he would have just read chapter 2 a couple minutes ago. Chapter 2, verse 4. Here's what Paul just told Timothy. Well, I'll go ahead and start in verse 3. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ. Okay, now verse 4 through 6. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the everyday affairs of life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Verse 5, also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Verse 6, a hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive the share of his crops. Now, verse 4, what's the image? It starts with, with an S. Soldier, great. Verse 7, it's going to be verse 5, what's the image? Athlete. Verse 6, what's the image? So look up here a minute. In this order, soldier, athlete, farmer, yes? Can you all say it with me? Soldier, athlete, farmer. Great. Soldier, athlete, farmer. Soldier, athlete, farmer. I go to verse 6 of, it's going to be 7 of chapter 4. Now again, Timothy would have just read this five minutes ago. I have fought the good fight. Well, who in the world fights fights? Soldiers. Oh. So back to my thought, if, if we want to live a well-lived life, it's going to cost you dearly. Point number two, here's the path. In other words, here's what you need to do to live a well-lived life. Number one, or letter A, or however you take notes, a soldier who's single-minded, he's a soldier who's preparing for battle, who has the single-mindedness of a soldier. Think of it that way. So just the single-mindedness, this focus of a soldier. He said back in chapter 2, we're not going to keep flipping back and forth, he says this, no soldier in active duty entangles himself in the everyday affairs of life. Now, I've never been a soldier, okay? But I'm literally within two miles of the largest military base on planet Earth, Fort Bragg. Okay, Fort Bragg has 60,000 active duty soldiers. Not retired, 60,000 active duty soldiers. So I've learned a little bit about soldiering. Here's what I know. Uh, they have to have focus, especially when we deploy them. Uh, no soldier, when he or she is deployed, if they're a very good soldier, is going to be looking at his or her cell phone thinking, I wonder what my investments in Bitcoin did yesterday. 
You know, you can get yourself really hurt, even killed, by look, not being focused. So they don't look at market prices of the stock market, wherever they have money invested. They're not looking at the ESPN site to see if their favorite team won or lost last night. Not looking at Facebook and Twitter and Instagram to figure out what their friends from high school say. They're focused on a couple things. What is my commander telling me to do? Maybe from the negative side, what, who, who's the enemy and what's the enemy trying to do? You ever thought about what, who your enemies, enemies are as a believer in Jesus? Here's, we, here's the way we answer that question sometimes. Our enemy is that person, you know, that church down the street or my neighbor. No, no, no. Here's what the Bible says your, your three enemies are. Satan, the world system, and your flesh. Satan tells you you can't trust God. You just make life all about you. That's kind of what he whispers into your mind and your thoughts. The world system says, well, just value stuff over people. And your flesh says, you know, <laughs> you have a lot more fun if you just kind of gravitate toward this as Hebrews says, this besetting sin, this sin that so easily entangles us. That's the same word he uses here. Don't entangle yourself in the world. If I'm a, a soldier, I want to give myself my, I'm just going to be single-minded, focused on this is what God wants me to do. And here are my enemies trying to divert me from what God wants me to do. As an illustration, I thought about two people, Jesus and Paul. Jesus and Luke. 9.51, here's what the, Luke, the human writer, says, that Jesus set his face resolutely to go to Jerusalem. He knew that people in Jerusalem hated him. He knew that people in Jerusalem wanted to kill him. He said, you know what? I'm going directly to Jerusalem. He set his face like a flint. That's where I'm going. Now at a much lower level, but certainly I still a high level, the Apostle Paul. None, none of us would say the Apostle Paul didn't live a good life. Uh, and Paul said this, my paraphrase, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Therefore, knowing this, that we're all going to be dead someday and we're going to stand before Jesus to give an account for our life, he said, therefore, my objective in life is to please the Lord. Please the Lord. Some of you, I noticed in Dan's office a little bit ago, remember about 20 years ago, there was a really best-selling book by Rick Warren named Purpose Driven Life. You all remember that book, some of you, right? And it'd be cool to kind of think, well, I don't want to be like if you could talk to the Apostle Paul and, he, and say, Paul, what was your purpose in life? What was your number one goal in life? Remember the single-mindedness of a soldier, right? And here's what I know. You don't have to wonder what would Paul say. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he tells us, he says, I only have one ambition in all of my life, and that is at the end of life, Jesus says, outstanding. You lived a good life. Wow. That takes single-mindedness because we tend to get off track. You, you all admit willing to admit this? You get off track a little bit. We're kind of like the ADD uh, person, spiritually speaking. Here, you know, we're, we're tracking along and squirrel. You know, and, and we set these New Year's resolutions. God, this year I'm going to do X, and then within ten minutes, it seems like we we're off onto something else. Single-mindedness of a soldier who's in combat. So that's what it's going to take to live a life that's well lived. So again, a rhetorical question: Are you focused on the goal? Are you vigilant for your enemies? Is your goal in life to, for Jesus to say outstanding the way you live life? And if that's your goal, trust me, it changes the way you live today. We'll go back to chapter uh, 4, verse 7. Remember, soldier is the first one, right? That was, I saw a head shaking. Soldier, what's the second one? Athlete. Athlete. Well, verse 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course. I think now of a runner. Right? This is a runner running like we'd say like a marathon. I have finished the course. So here's my second observation. If you're going to live a well-lived life, you have to live life like a, have a discipline like, have discipline like an athlete. You know, you don't run marathon by just going out and saying, eh, I think I'll just, yeah, I'll run 26 miles, 385 yards today. There's a lot of discipline that goes into the training. He says, I finished the course. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're not going to go there. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, Paul uses some very similar imagery of a race. There actually uses two images, a, a person who's a runner and a person who's a boxer. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, in light of this whole thing he just said for a couple verses, therefore I buffet my body. That's what the New American Standard says. A friend of mine says it this way, the American, not, this is a New American Standard Bible, the American Standard version is I buffet my body. <laughs> Think about that just a minute. Some of us are going to go to a buffet after lunch, after service today, and here's what buffet means. Like, 
just bring it on. I don't cook anything and just keep on giving me, and I eat too much, right? And I have a life of ease. Like, no, he, he didn't say I buffet my body. He said I buffet my body. And if you look in the margin of your New American Standard, the idea for buffet, buffet, sorry if I say buffet, <laughs> if you buffet your body, those you, you discipline it. it. The word literally means bruise. And those of you who have kids or maybe used to participate in sports, you know how when kids come home from practice or all the stuff they do and they got these little nicks and bruises, you know, what happened to you? Oh, just practicing, right? They're subjecting their, their bodies to this idea of you're, you're making muscles hard or rigid and strong. And the only way that happens is through some discipline. Same passage, Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says this, that an athlete exercises self-control. He doesn't say in some things. All things. Self-control in all things. So here's part of what this idea of this athlete would entail. That we don't we don't give up, we don't quit, we keep on going. I don't know about you, but there have been some things in my life that I started doing for Jesus that in a matter of six weeks or six months I quit and gone on to something else. No, 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 I said, I don't give up. The thing that I'm thrilled that my mom and dad taught me as a kid, you don't quit. Period. I was a really bad baseball team growing up. And my dad used to say, about six games in, we're 0 and 6. Yeah. Dad, I think I'm going to quit. He said, Well, you can quit at the end of the season, but you don't quit in the middle of the season. That's what a, forget baseball. That's what, there's an awful lot of people who start out the Christian life, man, they're gung ho. And by the second or third mile, and man, this is, this is terrible. I think I'll just give up on this. In health, you guys can speak out here. If you want to be really, really healthy, would you agree that doctors tell us you have to have diet and, what's the other part? Exercise. Diet and exercise. Not one or the other. Diet and exercise. Great. And uh, spiritually speaking, the same thing happens. You have to have diet and exercise. So on the diet side, uh, interacting with a steady dose of this. And here's what an athlete does. Do you, would you all admit that there are some days you don't really feel like giving 30 minutes to reading this thing? Would you all admit that? And here's what a spiritually uh, mature Christian athlete does. I may not feel like it this morning or this afternoon. I am going to be in that word anyway, period, because I know it's good for me. And it's not just intake. It's also this idea of prayer, talking to the Lord, just pouring your heart out to it. So I would call diet, intake, study the word, and prayer. That, that's what's going to make me strong. But this is, what's the exercise part, Bill? Well, that would be service. What am I doing as I get all this stuff from the Lord? What am I doing to help other people out? How, who am I serving? How am I serving? That's, that's what a, what's an athlete does. He, he or she is disciplined. They don't give up. Well, soldier, athlete, what was the last one? Farmer. Farmer. Look at verse 7 again. I have fought the good fight, there's the soldier. I have finished the course, there's the uh, athlete. I have kept the faith. What what does kept the faith have to do with a farmer? Well, I don't know much about farming. I grew up right in Tulsa. If you know the corner of 61st and Yale, there's not a big corn field there or soybeans or whatever. Well, there was. Can I be so bold? That was before my time. (laughs) We, We don't have a lot of stuff there, but I know a little bit about farming, and here's what I know about farming. Uh, a farmer plants a crop, whatever said crop is, okay, and then he or she needs to wait, patiently wait, and trust that God, even if the person doesn't believe in God, trust that there's going to be some precipitation fall from the heavens. And after precipitation and some sunshine, and depends on the crop, after a period of time, what's going to happen? There will be a harvest. Wow, that takes faith, like a farmer. Farmer plants stuff, and after so much time, the farmer gets a crop. Now, again, this is probably showing my ignorance. You can plant something in your vegetable garden like squash or corn or tomatoes or something, and in about 90 to 120 days, you'll start getting some of that stuff, three or four months, yes? Can you all do this? Okay. But, you know, my father-in-law, who's now with the Lord, used to plant pecan trees, pecan orchard. Oh, no, 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 you don't get that in 120 days. Maybe you start getting some pecans in about 10 or 15 years, but if you really want to get them a mature, full crop, well, wait 30. He planted a lot of pine trees. 
near the end of his life, when he was in his early 80s, he said this. I thought a lot of maturity. He said, with all those pine trees I'm planting, I'll never see any of that stuff harvested. He said to Martian and her siblings and his grandkids, that, that's going to be for you guys to see someday. See, that's, that's a lot of wisdom for a farmer. Sowing. Eventually there's going to be a harvest, a crop. Now most of us don't do vegetables and stuff, so just think about the Christian life, if you will. There's this thing called evangelism. You ever shared your faith with somebody and they didn't immediately jump on and say, absolutely, I want that. It's going to take some time to till the soil. Maybe plant some seed. Maybe, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, water the seed. And maybe eventually there's a harvest. And it maybe won't even happen in your lifetime. Maybe it happen at your funeral when you're in a casket somewhere and somebody says, well, this is about, and they tell your life, and somebody says, oh, wow, all that stuff that so-and-so said now makes sense, and they come to faith after you, uh, already with the Lord. Mm. And think about discipleship. I think this is a significant part of what parenting is about, not that I know a ton about parenting, but you, know, you build into your kids and you hope that they take this stuff and do something with it, but sometimes they don't do anything with it until much, much, much later. Wow. So what's it going to take? It's the, it's the faith of a farmer who says, I'm going to plant some squash, I'm going to plant some corn, I'm going to plant pine trees, I'm going to plant pecan trees, and here's what I believe, that someday God's going to bring rain and sunshine, and whether it's 120 days or 30 years, he's going to bring a crop out of all of this stuff that I'm doing. That takes faith, faith of a farmer. So, so what does it take if I can just be so bold from chapter 4, verse 7, what path do I have to take to live a well-lived life? Have the single-mindedness of a soldier, the discipline of an athlete, the faith of a farmer. This, this stuff, something's going to happen. Well, that's all well and good, Corver. So, <laughs> what if I do all that stuff? What's the outcome? I mean, is the outcome even worth it? Well, I'll let you be the judge. Here's the, the prize of a well-lived life. Chapter 4. Verse 8. Remember, this is Paul's last letter. I don't know this, but I happen to think that within a matter of days, he was murdered by Nero and his life's over. Here's what he says. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Now, let me stop right there. We're going to finish the verse in just a second. Does Paul have this sense that this is a probably won't happen sort of thing. No. He doesn't say might, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Do you see that? You can only say that when you've lived the life that's well lived. I'm quite confident, Paul says, I'm not, Paul's saying to Timothy, I am quite confident that in that day, Jesus is going to award me a prize. Oh, great. Paul, what's the prize? He calls it the crown of righteousness. Well, yeah, we're not going to go there. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that's one of Paul's favorite passages about the Olympics of his day. Here's what he says there. Corver paraphrase. The Olympic athletes of our day train for three years, several hours a day. They compete by the rules. They don't cheat. Compete by the rules. They buffet their bodies. They do all this stuff. And they hoped to win. And in Paul's day, it was win or go home. There was no silver, no bronze, winner or see you next time. Do you remember what the award was? A laurel wreath, okay? Uh, we're not really into laurel. Just think of it this way, some ivy. It's an English ivy you stripped off the side of your house. You get that? Get some, and you weave it together into a little crown. You say to somebody, you worked for three years, and they happen to win... There you go. Outstanding. People cheer. Right? You know what happens to ivy about a week after you cut it off a vine? It wilts. It starts to fall apart. The leaves turn brown, and uh, then they fall off. And you think, wait a minute. That guy, sorry ladies, but I didn't have female athletes back in the first century. That guy worked for three years, and his prize is some applause, and the prize falls apart in a week. Yep, you got it. Now they got some, you know, even in that culture, like our culture, we idolize sports people, right? Ah, great. But you know what happens when you get to be an old sports person? You're a has-been, okay? 
I shouldn't tell you this, but you could probably tell by looking, I'm not a kid anymore. At 61, let's suppose I had, this is a huge, let's suppose I had been a world-class athlete in my 20s. Now I'm an old has-been. People didn't used to ask me for my autograph, but trust me, if they had 40 years ago, they're sure not asking these days. Can y'all do this? Okay. By the way, I'll sign afterwards if you don't. <laughs> You're just an old athlete, right? That's what you got for three years of effort in Paul's day. And he contrasts it in that same passage in 1 Corinthians. It says, but they do it for this perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable one that never fades. Now, I know you guys are bright. How long is Jesus going to be king? Forever. Forever. And if he awards you a crown as one of his under kings, remember he's the king of kings, as one of his under kings or queens, how long will that crown be yours? And how long will you rule and reign? By the way, a little trick question there. Go to Revelation 22.5, and it's a really long time. It's just a little bit longer than a long, long, long time. It's forever. And here's what I think. So, so what's the cost? The cost is you, like an athlete and a soldier in a farm, and you do this stuff, and you get poured out like a tube of toothpaste. And, is it really worth it? He says, yeah, you get this crown. How long will I get to rule and reign? Well, forever. So you're telling me in 10 billion years, in 10 billion years, you'd just be started. I think, wow, <laughs> 60 years of service for 10 billion? Wow, that seems like a really good investment to me. Now, if you're thinking, here's what some of you are thinking. Wait a minute, Corbett. Paul's writing this, and I'm not even in the same category with Paul. Would you all agree to that? Yeah. Well, I'm, <laughs> who am I to compare myself with Paul? Really? Look at verse 8. Here's how it concludes. Well, let me read the whole verse again. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and it does not end in a period. Yes? Now notice what it says. And not only to me, but also to all that could include you, but also to all who love his appearing. Here's what that's saying. If you live for Jesus, if you live in such a way that says, you know what, I want to live a well-lived life. Here's what, in essence, you're doing. You're loving his appearing. I cannot wait for Jesus to come back. And when you love his appearing, you can't wait for him to come back. You're focused like a soldier. You're disciplined like an athlete. And you're patient like a farmer. Because you can't wait to see what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. So, would you agree that the last part of verse 8 could include anybody in this room? Well, sure it could. Which means that you could get that same crown that Paul said he knew he was going to get. You say, well, Bill, in all honesty, that's not the way I've been living. Well, let me give you a couple thoughts here. You can't change yesterday. Would you agree to that? Here's what you can do. You can say, you know what? Starting today, March the 7th, 2020, when I'm putting a mark in the sand, and I'm going to start doing this stuff, I am committing to living a life that's well-lived, that Jesus would say, outstanding. Okay? Put a mark in the sand. Here's what I intend to do. Let me also give you another piece of advice. Whatever. Tell somebody. Here's what I've noticed when I tell somebody I'm going to do something. If I say to somebody in my, on my staff at the college, I'm going to uh, lose 15 pounds. If I just do it in my head, nothing even happens. And I could eat six donuts on the way home. Nobody even knows, right? Well, they would know, but they don't know about my goal, right? <laughs> but if I tell one of my staff members, I have a guy who works with my name, Chris. I say to Chris, hey, Chris, I'm going to lose 15 pounds between now and my birthday. Here's what Chris will do. Oh, three or four weeks, and I say, hey, uh, he's too deferential. He doesn't ever call me Bill. He always calls me Doc. Doc Corber, how's that, how's that going? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I had a couple of donuts yesterday. It's not going so well, Chris. But it helps keep me on my toes, some accountability. So may I rec- recommend that, one, that you put a mark in the sand. Then secondly, tell somebody about the mark in the sand that you made and say, hey, would you, would you just ask me every so often how I'm doing? Last, in a room this size, I don't know everybody, maybe somebody's here who's never trusted in Jesus. What a great song Mike led with. Those words in red, let me give you one of my favorite words in red verses. Jesus in John 6.47 said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. You say you have to do lots of great things, have a wonderful name, three degrees, believe in Jesus. What's he promising? Eternal life. He says, if you'll believe me to give you life eternal, I'll do it. 
That's how great a God he is. That's how gracious he is. If you've never done that, wow, today is the day to do it. And I'm not trying to scare you. You know, with everything else, the uncertainty of life, especially with COVID and all that, nobody's granted tomorrow. Trust him today. So trust him today. Be a challenge for maybe somebody, for somebody else. Put my mark in the sand. When Jesus, when this is all said and done, I want Jesus to say, wow, well-lived life. Let me close this in prayer, all right? Father, we're grateful for the time in your word today. Thank you that we don't just have to fear a wasted life. We can live a well-lived life, and it's not one that we make up. It's one your scriptures, the word, tells us about, that we can be poured out like a drink offering. We can be, we can be disciplined and focused and have faith that you're going to do things, and, uh, and you'll actually do it. Thank you that we don't do this for us, but for your honor and glory. And your great grace, Lord, you even say, I'm going to give you a prize at the end of the life, a crown of righteousness. Thank you for your graciousness to us, that you enable us through your spirit to serve you. But even then, when it's all said and done, you reward us for faithful service. May we be characterized as a people who live life well. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.